Live, where news comes first. This is ABC7 Extra. It's Sunday, December 7th. Welcome to ABC7 Extra. Good evening. I'm Ashley Rodriguez in for Maria Garcia. This week, we saw outrage, protest, and mistrust. Thousands of protesters across the nation took to the streets to protest a grand jury's decision not to indict an officer in the death of Eric Gardner. The controversy no, comes on the heels of the grand jury decision in Ferguson, Missouri, which decided Officer Darren Wilson should not stand trial in the death of Michael Brown. For the next half hour, we'll talk about grand juries, what they are, how they work. We'll also talk about the feelings that are fueling these protests and the effect the current environment may have on the relationships between police and the community. Our guests tonight are Defense Attorney Joe Spencer and Jim Jopling, an attorney with the Combined Law Enforcement Associations of Texas, and of course, you. Email us your comments and questions now to abc7extra at kvia.com. You can also reach us at 915-496-1775. On Twitter, we're at abc7breaking. Use the hashtag abc7extra. We now have more information on what went on inside the grand jury that voted not to indict the officer who killed Eric Garner. Jean Cesares reports. We now know the grand jury hearing Eric Garner's case sat for nine weeks, heard from 50 witnesses, and saw 60 exhibits. What evidence was actually presented to this grand jury, we will never fully know because it is secret. But one has to be this video, which shows officers confronting the 350-pound man. Is it important for the grand jury at all as the original state of mind? Well, it tells us a little about what the officers were confronting, because they can see exactly what kind of agitated state Mr. Garner was in. The tension is high almost from the moment officers approach Garner. It shortly becomes physical. Officer Daniel Pantaleo's attorney says his client was simply attempting to make an arrest, telling the New York Times he wanted to get across to the grand jury that it was never his intention to injure or harm anyone. Intent can be inferred from watching his actions, and the officer would have had to explain away in that picture. We now know the grand jury saw four videos. Different angles are going to tell us different things about the vantage point or where force was being applied and when. And then the chokehold. His attorney said the officer told the grand jury it was never supposed to be a chokehold. But the medical examiner confirmed that the chokehold and pressure to Garner's chest contributed to the 43 year old's death. The problem with these holds is that even if you start off not intending to uh, cut off the air supply, a suspect can turn right into it very easily and cut off their own air supply. And that's why these holds have been considered incredibly dangerous, mm -hmm. and many police departments have banned them. Well, here's where the autopsy report becomes paramount, uh, of paramount importance. There is, as I understand this, evidence of hemorrhage. Uh, and my um, assumption now is that we're talking hemorrhage in the strap muscles, uh, which would occur in the type of chokehold which cuts off the circulation to the brain. Garner also had health problems that may have been a factor, including asthma, obesity, and hypertensive cardiovascular disease. His last few words have become a rallying cry. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! Pantaleo's attorney says he acknowledged that he heard Mr. Garner saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, and insisted that he tried to disengage as quickly as he could. But looking at the video, Officer Pantaleo can be seen helping other officers keep Garner down. And the reality is the medical examiner ruled the death of Eric Garner a homicide, death at the hands of another. The grand jury just couldn't single out that person as Officer Pantaleo. Jean Casares, CNN, New York. And while many have decried the death of another black man at the hands of a white officer, there's not evidence that Panaleo's actions were racially motivated. His supervising sergeant at the scene was black, and so were some of the officers involved in the confrontation. We'll get to the race debate in just a few minutes. I just wanted to get the facts out there as we start our discussion. Again, joining me now are defense attorney Joe Spencer and Jim Jopling, an attorney with CLEAT, which represents law enforcement agents. Let's talk about grand juries. They're an important part of the justice system, but they're different from 
ordinary ju juries. Talk yeah, about the difference. Yeah, yeah, yes, they are actually. Really, what a grand jury consists of it's uh, twelve individuals that are that are summoned to a uh, to a court. There's a thirty fourth district grand jury, the one sixty eighth. Um, and the 120th grand jury. And what a judge does is he'll summon a jury pool, and uh, from there there will be a selection of 12 jurors that go into a grand jury. Uh, the grand jury is basically a probable cause type of setting. Uh, individuals that go before a grand jury, uh, typically you never see a defendant in person that goes before a grand jury. The vast majority of the times you have a prosecutor, you have the court reporter that's in there, and they present evidence in what they believe there is probable cause that a crime has been committed by a certain individual. A grand jury will then issue either a true bill of indictment or a no bill of indictment. And there's some differences with grand juries. They're usually not sequestered. The jurors don't have to swear they have no opinions. It's harder to strike a grand juror from a case and jurors can go out and seek their own information. They also don't have to be in total agreement on a verdict and indictments are based on whether there is probable cause but there's much lower proof so talk about some of those differences and why is that well that is in the texas constitution that is the, the wisdom of the legislature how they formulate the grand jury uh, but you're absolutely right it really just takes nine grand jurors that's a that's the same amount that constitutes a quorum in texas to for them to return a true verdict or that is a true bill of indictment uh, that's really all that's required. Uh, the, the other thing that is a little concerning for, for a defense attorney is that the rules of evidence don't apply. Um, it is, there is no judge in there. Um, the, the, uh, the evidence can be come in by merely hearsay. It can be double hearsay, it can be triple hearsay. It is somebody saying, this is what we believe happened, and based on what we're telling you what we believe happened, do, would you like to issue either a true bill of indictment or a no bill of indictment? Now, a lot of people think, what was this grand jury thinking in the Gardner case? Now, with the Michael Brown case, the attorney decided to release the information that they saw. But in the Staten Island Gardner case, the attorney is not releasing what the grand jury saw. Why is that? Well, in, in Texas, excuse, in Texas uh, grand jury proceedings are secret. You cannot dis divulge or disclose what is a grand jury hears or doesn't hear. But you're right about one thing. Grand jurors in Texas have a tremendous amount of power. They have the power to investigate. They have the power to have an investigator go out and subpoena witnesses. They have the power to cross-examine witnesses. They actually have the power to tell the prosecutor to leave the grand jury room and conduct their investigation. They have that power. Uh, I don't know if they're privy to that much information of what they're, they're told, but a grand jury does have a tremendous amount of power in Texas if they exercise it properly. And speaking of power, prosecutors have a lot of power in grand juries, whereas defense attorneys, not so much. You yourself are a defense attorney. How do you prepare your clients for a case like that? Well, it's very difficult. Uh, there are occasions when most of the time when I get hired, uh, or get appointed, it's simply after the grand jury proceedings. My client has already been indicted. But in a situation where I am being told ahead of time that my client is going before the grand jury, then it is very difficult to do. You can't go into the grand jury. You have to prepare your client as to what the facts are and what he knows. Uh, he is allowed to leave the grand jury proceedings ver literally every time the question is being asked and consult with his attorney and then go back and give an answer. But you do that a few times and the grand jury just gets extremely suspicious if you keep coming out mm -hmm. to visit with your lawyer. So it's a very difficult time to prepare a client before a grand jury. Most of my clients do not go before the grand jury for the simple reason is that I'm not in there. I'm not able to hear what the prosecutors are saying. Uh, the prosecutor is in there and it seems to be a little one-sided. All right. Well, the question of the night. Uh, there's a famous saying that goes, a grand jury would indict a ham sandwich, if that's what you wanted. Then why is it that these cases returned no indictments? Yeah, that's a that's a very uh, interesting point. You, that's the quote by uh, Judge Saul Wachler, who was um, the the judge at the highest court in the state of New York. Back in the 1980s, he made that comment during a press interview, and uh, it just caught fire. And over the decades, grand juries and and prosecutors have been criticized for having a bit of prosecutorial bias in grand jury proceedings. Um, Justice Scalia recently spoke out about grand juries and how, you know, typically it's the arresting officer and, and maybe the complaining witness. And that's the limited amount of information that is typically brought before a grand jury and that prosecutors do have so much sway that they could indict a ham sandwich. Um, now the dialogue has shifted uh, so that um, 
the uh, grand juries now in, in uh, Ferguson and in New York are actually being uh, looked at and scrutinized for presenting too much information to the grand jurors. And so it's, it's almost like the, the, the pendulum has shifted the other direction and now the prosecutors are being criticized for scrutinizing the evidence too much, presenting too many witnesses, taking too long to present the case. Yeah, as a prosecutor, you can withhold evidence against the person accused and use that to get an indictment. Have you seen that strategy employed before? Well, I'm not a prosecutor, so I, I can only tell you that a prosecutor should not withhold evidence from a grand jury. A prosecutor should give all aggravating evidence, mitigating evidence, whatever is favorable or non-favorable. That is what should occur, but there is so much secrecy around the grand jury proceedings where it's only privy to the prosecutor and the grand jurors and the court reporter, and there is a cloak of secrecy. Uh, it cannot be disclosed. Uh, I don't know what is actually being conducted in the grand jury proceedings. Okay. This conversation is just getting started, and we haven't yet touched on the topic of race. We want to hear from you. Feel free to call us at 915-496-1775, email us at abc7extra at kbia.com, and at Twitter at abc7breaking. Stay with us. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back to ABC7 Extra. Joining us now are Joe Spencer, a defense attorney, and Jim Jopling, an attorney with CLEAT, which represents law enforcement officers. We are talking about the cases in Ferguson, Missouri, and Staten Island. And I have a question for you, Jim. Law enforcement officers have to make split life or death decisions, and many times the key words they use are they feared for their life. And they use that to justify the use of deadly force. Now, the officers in the Eric Garner case were not in distress. So was the use of force justified in your opinion? Well, I mean, first of all, the Eric Garner case is obviously an extremely unfortunate case. Uh, and, and I think you're correct. The video makes it absolutely <laughs> clear that there's no officer whose life is in jeopardy at that point. Um, and that's going to be a case of whether or not the tactics were proper, whether or not the, the force was applied correctly, as opposed to whether or not deadly force was applied. Uh, the issue being the chokehold. Chokeholds are prohibited. Uh, they're they're a, uh, a tactic that can result in, in the results that you see in that video. Uh, very unfortunate indeed. I'm not an expert on, on tactics, um, but I understand that there is a certain type of hold that was referred to in your report that is designed to cut off the flow of blood to the brain as opposed to oxygen. And, um, but I don't know if, if the officer in that case tried to apply that particular hold. I understand that's a very effective way to subdue a suspect. Um, but obviously in that case, use of deadly force probably was not justified. Uh, but again, the question is going to be, was the officer trying to apply deadly force? And only the officer is going to know that at this stage. Why not negligence or excessive force? Why couldn't they get him on something lesser? Um, well, and that's a question that only the grand jury is going to know. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also have to understand that uh, that officer is not in the clear. Um, probably, under New York law, it would be the same as Texas law, the same as Missouri law. A special prosecutor could be appointed and convene another state grand jury. Uh, the federal government could look into this matter, as it often does in these matters, and could convene its own grand jury. Uh, so, you know, those are, those are possibilities. And uh, if they... If they don't have enough facts or don't have enough evidence to meet that higher burden of uh, murder, uh, perhaps, yeah, some type of lesser charge could be brought. Eric Gardner suffered from asthma. He had heart conditions. He, he was obese. Um, so when an officer says that he, had the justif he was justified in using deadly force, uh, mm -hmm. do those factors go into a jury's decision that the, the suspect had health issues and that could have led to some complications with the arrest? You know, in civil cases, kind of the general rule is you, you take your plaintiff as you find him. When you're dealing with law enforcement, the law enforcement officer doesn't always know what the health condition is. Uh, one of the first type, one of the, I guess right after I got my law degree, a friend of mine who was a police officer in another city came up to me and, and said that he had subdued a shoplifter at a store. He applied all the tactics correctly, acted exactly in accordance with his training, um, took the suspect down to the floor, 
but the suspect, the suspect expired right there from cardiac arrest. And there was no indication that, that he had any kind of um, you know, breathing obstruction or he wasn't choked or anything like that. Uh, he just had a heart condition. Mm -hmm. and, and the gentleman expired right there. And so, you know, it's, police officers face these situations and they face the fear of these situations all the time. Uh, so proper tactics can be applied. Uh, they can be applied correctly and you can get this type of result. They can be applied incorrectly and you can get this type of result. Uh, or it may just be that they used improper tactics. Okay, we have a caller, Joe from the east side. Joe, what's your question or comment? Hello, um, just wondering how much of a factor of when a police officer says, put your hands up, you're going to be under arrest, and someone resists arrest, what should the police officer do? Isn't isn't the police officer trying to make an arrest and a, a person clearly not wanting to be arrested? How much of a factor does a grand jury, or should anybody consider these protesters, do they consider that the person was resisting arrest? Thank you. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, Joe brings a, he raises a good point. It absolutely should be considered. This is what's unique in the Gardner case is that we actually had video, and as I understand from the story, there was four different angles of the video, so you got to see whether or not combined all the officers, whether or not they were in fear or danger in themselves. You, you ask, could there have been a lesser of a, a, a manslaughter, criminal negligent homicide, uh, some sort of lesser included offense uh, instead of intentionally and only trying to take the life of this individual. But you could see from the video that when Mr. Gardner was put to the floor, he was no longer resisting. He mm -hmm. was subdued. And whether or not there was an accessibility of everybody piling up on him and trying to keep him down, because he is a rather large man, uh, is a question that, from the different angles, that grand jury would have seen everything and would have had a better understanding of what was going on. They probably heard testimony from all the officers that were involved. Uh, but when and a police officer tells an individual, put your hands up and you, you know, you, you're under arrest, and if you start to resist arrest, it doesn't give the officer a license to pull out a firearm and to discharge that firearm because deadly force is not being used against that officer. There should be that force that is reasonable to subdue that individual and then common sense should kick in. Okay, do you have anything to say to that? Yeah, officers are trained um, uh, along the lines of a use of force continuum. So they're supposed to start with the, the least amount of force that gets the job done. And of course they're entitled to meet you know the force that they are confronted with with the appropriate level of force but you know you have you have hand restraint uh, you have um, you know less than lethal force devices like a taser uh, a baton and then of course you have lethal force but you have to understand that even hand-to-hand -hand combat can result in lethal force I mean we've we've recently had uh, an El Paso police officer and El Paso constable both were uh, uh, murdered uh, with hand-to-hand -hand combat from an individual uh, out, out there in the community. And so there may be a use of force continuum. It may look great on paper. It may sound great in theory. But even hand-to-hand -hand combat can, can result in and become lethal force. We have a tweet from J.D. He says, use of force is all officers' perception of a threat. It's too easy to be a Monday morning quarterback. We also have a caller, Fred, from the Northeast. He also has a question or comment for our guest. Go ahead, Fred. Yes, yeah, so my question is this, why are people saying that this is uh, disgusting and controversial? Because we do not know the evidence that the grand juries have. Why are we saying that this is racial? I mean, my gosh, I mean, the grand juries have the evidence. We don't know. We're just speculating. Let the grand juries do their job. That is my question and thought. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. It's true. I mean, we know that race did not play a factor in this case, but we also aren't privy to what the grand jury saw. We don't know if they saw evidence that showed that his health condition, you know, meant that, you know, there was no way that he would have survived that. Or we, we don't know. Fred, Fred brings a very good point. Uh, only the grand jury heard all of the evidence, uh, saw all, all the different angles from the video, uh, and po all probability heard from every one of the officers and maybe other bystander or other witnesses. Uh, it is much criticism I have of many members in the community sometimes when they criticize the jury's decision. Uh, only the jurors really hear all of the evidence, and we should give them uh, the ability to, to 
get have some faith in the system. You know, I'm a strong believer in the jury system. I think it works wonderful as long as everybody plays by the rules. Okay. And we know that race wasn't a factor in this decision, but that doesn't mean it's not fueling anger across the country. After a short break, we'll talk about that, and we want to hear from you. Email us, call us, and tweet us. The information's on your screen. We'll be back shortly. You can't watch TV without hearing about the Michael Brown and Eric Garner cases, and you don't even have to be watching the news. Even Saturday Night Live touched on the topic last night. A Staten Island grand jury on Wednesday decided not to indict a New York City police officer in the death of Eric Garner because I guess even the jury didn't want to seem like they were resisting police. <laughs> Both grand juries failed to indict those cops? You know, it used to be you said you were racist to get out of jury duty. Now being racist seems like a requirement. <laughs> I mean, these decisions were so bad that I might actually... What do you think about that? You know, I hear that phrase a lot, failed to indict. And that phrase implies that a grand jury has a duty to indict. And they, they don't have a duty to indict. They have a duty to look into the case, uh, which, you know, they should do. Now, I understand there is a complete disconnect between public perception and what's going on in these grand juries. The public perception, there almost seems to be a presumption of racism if there is an officer involved in a use of force case and his race is different than the uh, suspect or the, the victim in the case. Mm -hmm. um, that's an unfortunate uh, set of circumstances. You know, I don't think it's ever an unhealthy thing for people in this country to have an open dialogue about race. I mean, if you look at our country as a family, we're kind of dysfunctional. We have this racism problem. We've had it for hundreds of years. Our financial house isn't in order. But I think, you know, people need to understand that there's just a different set of standards in a grand jury versus the public setting. You have the, the, the gentleman who sent the tweet earlier about Monday morning quarterbacking. That's actually built into the law. The U.S. Supreme Court stated in their Graham v. Connor opinion that you're not supposed to look at an officer's actions with the benefit of hindsight. You're supposed to place yourself in his shoes, review his actions from the standpoint of a reasonable person in that situation with the understanding that the circumstances around him are rapidly evolving and that he is uh, having to make decisions uh, within a matter of seconds or even split seconds. But do you think that an attorney um, or a prosecutor should pay more attention to the racial makeup of a jury? Well, race should not factor in. I will tell you that in El Paso, I think we're very fortunate. Uh, I don't believe that race plays any factor either with the juries or with our police officers, at least none that I have seen in, in over you know, a quarter century of trying cases. I just haven't really seen that. Uh, and I ask that because Staten Island has statistics of like 18% police officers, 10% blacks. That's the, the composition and the makeup that they have there and whatever requirement it is for, for Staten Island and those members of the constabulary to reach that, that level. Uh, I just don't see that here in El Paso. I think this community, we're very fortunate. Uh, I don't think that that type of bias, racial bias, takes place in the jury room, in the grand jury room, or even with the prosecutors when they're trying to prosecute a case. Uh, I, I agree with, with Jim. I think that you have to look at this not as a, Monday, Monday, as a Monday morning quarterback, but you look at it basically and give the grand jury the ability to absorb all of the information. I wish grand juries would become more proactive in their investigative powers. I wish they would take more of an investigative power and not just uh, rubber stamp whatever a prosecutor is telling them in the grand jury room. Okay, we have Art calling in from the east side. Art, what's your comment or question? Um, I've seen so many um, so many shows about the cops, and then when they're all together, why do they all have to be on top of that one person they're trying to, you know, um, put in in handcuffs? And I don't see why why it's so much of a a big deal to have all of them on top. If there's 20 of them, are they going to all be on top of them? Yeah, there is four officers involved. I think that would just in. cut somebody's circulation off, even then, without even choking them. Yeah. Thanks, Art. Yeah, there was four officers involved in the Garner. I mean, it just seems very excessive for cigarettes, for loose cigarettes. Now, in Michael Brown's case, um, he, was, he was committing a crime, um, and he was a big guy. He was coming at the officers. He was being kind of violent, whereas with Garner, he was selling cigarettes, and it just seemed a bit excessive. 
You know, that's a phenomenon that's happening more and more. And it's been going on for years, and it's, it's going to happen more and more, where actual uh, police incidents are being recorded on video, and the public is, is seeing how it works. Uh, people don't really understand that an officer, say, if he's in a deadly force situation and needs to fire his weapon, uh, he's going to fire that weapon until the threat is eliminated. And, um, you know, sometimes that may take an awful lot of shots. It's unfortunate. Uh, but say you're, you're firing a small caliber round. There was a case uh, here a good seven or eight years ago where there was an officer firing a small caliber uh, weapon at a person who, who had a toy gun that was, that was painted to look like mm -hmm. a real gun. And, um, you know, the threat wasn't being eliminated. That person was still on his feet. That person was still pointing his weapon at the officer. And so he kept firing. And the public was initially outraged at the number of shots that had been fired. But once the evidence came to light, and, and you know, fortunately this incident was recorded on video, uh, it became apparent that it was not an excessive amount of shots that were fired. But people just aren't used to seeing that. They're used yeah. to seeing what they see in the movies. They're used to seeing what they're seeing on TV. And more and more these days with, with public media, with everyone having a very high quality video camera in their pocket and in their cell phone, people are seeing how it really happens. And it's shocking. Before we go, we have George calling from the east side. George, what's your comment or question? Yeah, why would he... Why would Mr. Garden make a bad situation worse with all his health problems by resisting arrest? Well, you know, um, it did seem like he did eventually give in to the officer's demands when he was saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And yeah, we can't get into his mind. We do yeah. know that he was asking for some sort of an explanation. And certainly once they took him to the ground, he was not in a position to have a conversation with them. Uh, in fact, he, uh, he, he outcried, you know, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. Um, the show is almost over. I just want to get to a quick email real quick from Manny Hinojosa. If this individual had not resisted arrest, he would be alive. Otherwise, cops would have to be retrained and not arrest when there is danger to the perpetrator's health. So obviously, lots of emotions on both sides of the issue with both of these cases. Hopefully, the community nationally can come to terms with it and we can rebuild our relationship with law enforcement because for many people, it's damaged by these cases. Any little last things you'd like to add before we go? Jim? Yeah, I would agree that, that the public dialogue that's going on right now is an important dialogue. It, it, it's not something that should be brushed off. Um, there are so many instances in which you know, there's an explanation. There's a legal explanation. There's a tactical explanation. But the bottom line is that uh, police departments all over this country need to work to rebuild trust with the communities that they're serving. Fortunately, and I agree with Joe, I don't think we have the problems here in El Paso yeah. that, that are facing the rest of the country. We're a pretty racially diverse and integrated community. And, um, and that's a good thing. You know, that's a good thing. Um, but there needs to be a greater understanding uh, in the part of police departments, but also within the public as well. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me for tonight for ABC7 Extra. Thank you for joining us as well. Thank you for your calls and your comments. We'll see you next week.